this point, just because if I were you, I'd have some. <laughs> I don't know. Does anyone have any questions about what we're seeing? Right. I mean, it's so fascinating how you take these different aspects of the of life and really it's just a it's kind of a metaphor for humanity and it certainly could go on forever and at what point do you hit the stop button? We're, we're done cheating. Well, uh, you, you, it's crazy because that's literally what I was going to ask too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like, when is it over? Like you can continue evolving and adding to it. Yeah. Can, I, can I say, I mean, first of all, that's a really good question because it is it is absolutely true that, I mean, you could, we could just go on and on. I mean, originally we were going to be going on to Japan and Taiwan, but there has to be a certain point where you stop and you ask yourself the question like what is the domestic form of, of creativity? Like what is creativity that's not <laughs> just on the road, no house, you know, no, uh, no, really, I mean like there's an essay that I wrote um, with, called uh, 53 Beds um, that's up on our, on our blog that's basically about like those are the 53 beds that we stayed in while we were making this project and um, we had to press stop. At a certain point, we have to say, this is where it ends. And periphery, be, periphery as a geographical experiment of like two stories on opposite sides of the world, that seemed like the most appropriate, it seemed like the most difficult task to give ourselves, and the proper task to give ourselves to end this project the way that we wanted to. We still have interactive work to develop. Um, we will be taking migrants and periphery and putting them online very soon in, in a new way. But there had to be a point because otherwise it's like, you know, it's a beautiful line with red string everywhere, you know? Like, <laughs> so, yeah. Great question. I'm, I'm curious if in the online presence there will be more uh, historical background information. I'm specifically very interested in the Indonesian segments. And, uh, as, as we see it here, as, as uh, loops, I have no sense of where the synagogue came from or where these neo-Nazis came from. I, also, because I have zero understanding of the geography of Indonesia, uh, beyond you know, the sort of vague whatever, I have no sense of how close to one another they are geographically. Is there any contact? Is there any contact between those people? I mean, there is no, well, there is no contact between the two, what's, but what's very funny is that the Nazi, when we told the, the, the um, Jewish guy um, that the, we were filming Nazis, he said, he's like, what did they do? And we're like, oh, they, uh, they, do, um, they do reenactments in, in, in Nazi uniforms. And he learned how to speak English primarily through, like, New York um, Jewish people. Um, like, because he learned from like Kabat house people, and he goes, he goes, huh? Do they need the Judah chase? <laughs> we were scared to tell him. He, he thought it was really funny. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as the layering of, of information goes, um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that we've been very conscious of, also because it, it had to be out there for like we received you no know, public funding, arts funding, and we have to justify our existence. Like, if you get that. Luxury, you owe it to your funders, some of them are sitting in the front row, to show them every step of the process and be like, this is what we're using it for. Because if this is for the public good, like, this is for the public good. So we have a whole blog that's really, really deep that covers everything we've ever done that has historical information in it. And when it comes to the interactive version, there are multiple links to the blog, and then there are multiple essays that will give you historical context. Yeah, and then you can also get started in the work. The first interactive piece that we showed, called Cradle, is shot in Amsterdam. So that's the airport in Amsterdam, and it's showing you a very unique morgue. It's the only one in the world where the morgue is actually in the airport, and 
shipping 2,000 volumes a year because so many people living in the Netherlands were born elsewhere. And I think this is actually an industry that's going to keep growing because we are more and more a globalized society and there will be a need for people for a very streamlined and personalized way of um, shipping bodies. It's, you know, it sounds very crude, but um, it wasn't, we stumbled upon that story and we thought this is a beautiful way of showing that Holland has this multicultural society and, you know, the logistics of that um, through this, this morgue story, so. Please don't give us another assignment. I don't know if you can see it. Back to work. I mean, I think every interface, the audience should have the option to opt out of. I think that's absolutely the most important thing. I mean, we literally, like in terms of showing the, the last piece, where I was like, I'm just going to let it go. It's, partially that's because of seeing, you know, people, oftentimes you see in these presentations of interactive work that people are like, I'm going to use the interface right because I've created it and do that. So I thought kind of like, since everything we do is an experiment, why not use the interface in the most, literally the most sort of, you know, um, jumping way possible. Um, so, at the same time, you as a viewer could go and watch any one of those films all the way through. There would be more context. They got it. We wouldn't allow you that much context, but there would be more context. Um, and as far as Cradle, it's absolutely the same thing with Cradle, too, as we look to the back the other way. That's what we keep thinking about that way. Simplicity of interface and the ability to not use the interface, which, I mean, when you think about the mental breakdown that uh, we put Sam through with those lines, it's like, I feel really terrible saying like, oh no, you don't even have to use this thing. <laughs> Um, stepping back for a moment, um, uh, first of all, what a wonderfully imaginative project, but it's also very disruptive when you think of how much um, uh, people hold on to their identity. It, it has a, It's based in law a lot of the time. It's based in property. So you, you have the triumph of the will. You have these kinds of cinema that has also uh, reinforced this sense of identity Purity. So you come in with this project which sort of softening in a way uh, th because it's not consciously, po doesn't seem overtly political. It's just people talking about their lives. So at what point did you encounter anyone who got angry uh, when you explained to them your project was really about um, not purity but commonality? Um, legacy was also um, shown on location where it was shot, so our first audience was the community that we filmed. Um, angry, the only time someone got angry was in South Africa, where we showed this work, um, in a gallery where, uh, in a, this rapidly gentrifying neighborhood, and it was really interesting because part of that piece is the, we shot with Cape Malay community. They are descendants of slaves from Malaysia and Indonesia that the Dutch brought to southern Africa. And they originally live in that area, but now it's you know hip and galleries are there. And it was the first time they actually entered the art gallery um, in their own neighborhood. Um, there was one man who was very angry because he thought he was going to see an exhibition or a film about uh, Dutch colonial architecture in Cape Town. And <laughs> he, he, he couldn't let go, and we tried to explain to him, no, this is not about that, this is about the Cape Malay and, and you know, Afrikaners and Orania and all that, and he just wouldn't let go. He was so disappointed that, he, that we did not make a movie about 
architecture. I came here to see a bloody movie about bloody kid. Yeah. Couldn't really have architecture. Where is it? This is just people singing. Yeah, yeah I don't care about that. But I honestly, um, yeah, wherever we have the chance to screen it, um, maybe Kel remembers. Maybe I blocked out like that. I mean, there was, uh, there was, yeah, besides that, I mean, generally, in, we had one person die. We had one person that we felt died. And that was, um, that was hard afterwards because, you know, the family had sort of questions about, like, what are you going to do with this footage? You know? And um, we were like, well, since it's playing good for tomorrow, we're going to keep it in the film. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't really know why they wanted the footage taken out. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it was one of those situations where like, it's not, I'm not going to get too into it, but it's not anybody that you would think that it was. If the person is not depicted badly at all. Um, but it was without having seen the work. Um, and that was a tough situation, you know, but it, it had nothing to do with, had nothing to do with colonialism. But, this, go, but so. this goes to your original intention about what you wanted to do, the personal story that, that you shared about your family background, and then you bring in technology and this convergence of intention and technology. Tell me where the excitement was for you in being able to t story tell in this way. Well, I'm, you know, I'm not very muscular and, you know, it's just the two of us and we carry all our equipment ourselves, we film, you know, it's just the two of us doing everything. So I think technology, I mean, we wouldn't be able to do this 10 years ago, I think. But it wouldn't have looked good. You know, we could have brought a little video camera, but, you know, um, in that sense, technology is a huge part of this project. You just don't need that many people to make this. Um, yeah. Another question? Like, you know, 40 years, 63 days, a lot of time together. How did you negotiate the collaboration with the things? How did you make decisions? For the coins? Are you? I mean, it sounds like it's it, you're very distant the way you're describing it, but I would imagine that at times you, you really had to um, make some tough decisions. Are you implying that married couples argue? We have a rule. Our, our, our rule is if we don't both agree on a story, it's just not going to happen. Yeah, it's <laughs> tough sometimes. <laughs> so who would disagree more? <laughs> who disagrees more? Yeah. There's That's always two sides of the argument. Sometimes three. <laughs> more questions? Um, well, I guess we're sort of nearing the other. Did you want to show more? No, I mean, I just really want to encourage people, especially now that we have a big group of you in the room, I really want to encourage you guys to sort of reach across the aisle, take someone of the opposite gender into your bathroom. <laughs> it's only an eight minute loop on either side. I want you to experience it together. I want you to see both sides. And I want you to discuss it afterwards and say, hey, we watched two movies in two bathrooms tonight. And we're just fine. <laughs>